Hey, welcome to Trainable, the video podcast where we all engage in radical, honest conversations to simplify, socialize, and kickstart our well being journey. Join me as I'll chat with experts from various fields from all around the world, together with mates and everyday people like you and me. Together, we'll unravel the challenges we face in our daily lives and extract those valuable, trainable insights, cutting through all that noise out there in the industry. Think of Trainable as your virtual dinner party where we break down the complexity without the need for a PhD and focus on taking those simple steps to become better than we were yesterday. We're all on our unique journeys, and there's so much to learn from each other. I can't wait to share these enlightening conversations with you. Welcome to Trainable. We finally got here, the first episode today, and I guess it's a a deeply personal one. It's burnout unmasked, kind of unraveling the, the signs and the impact and the science that sits behind it as well. On today's podcast, we'll be identifying some of those red flags I can share from personal experience as well, understanding the physical and the mental effects of burnout as well, about those stories that we tell ourselves and how that can kind of influence things as well, the importance of open conversations and vulnerability, uh, and those insights and lessons um, that can hopefully promote better health and, and well-being and and hopefully some of this sharing might be able to support other people listening today. And I'm joined by three fantastic guests. I've got Simon Dubois, who's the psychologist who actually supported me through this. He's an expert working with a number of, uh, I guess, people that are in high impact um, uh, industries from business, athletes, uh, celebrities, a whole range of people. And he's been a, a instrumental in supporting me through this. His wife, Ren, who herself is phenomenal naturopath, um, unpacking, I guess, some of the chronic health conditions. Um, and she's just got an, an exceptional ability to make the complex simple throughout all of this. And she shares her personal experience as well around burnout. And my beautiful wife, Rach, of 30 years who I guess shares more of the intimate side as she gave me the the kick up the bum to actually get out there and, and see Simon initially, I guess the impacts at home and, you know, as we jointly kind of ride this crazy roller coaster of an entrepreneurial life as well. So hopefully today, um, listen, um, I share, I'm, I'm trying to be as vulnerable as possible today to try and share any of the lessons and hopefully you get something out of it. Enjoy. Hello. Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll tell you what, it, it feels, uh, this is a deeply personal one today, that's for sure. And uh, it's great, um, you know, I think normally very private person as well. So I think, you know, actually the podcast started uh, originally uh, based on, you know, a personal experience of burnout. Mm -hmm. And I think today, you know, obviously a lot of vulnerability to kind of discuss it, um, but also with people that, you know, I feel obviously really safe around and um, and also my wife, Rach, who's here today, uh, who, uh, you know, again, we're kind of pretty private people in all of this. So um, I really appreciate you coming on today, Rach, as well, because it's Thanks. one of these things which is a, it's definitely a shared experience and something that, you know, although one person goes through it, um, I know the effect on, on the household as well. But um, Simon, um, Ren, it was just great to have you on today. Uh, thanks very much for, for coming on. Maybe just kind of kicking off, maybe kind of just going back a little bit. I, I know when I shared regarding um, my personal burnout, I probably had about 150 to 200 people reach out, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them personal. And it kind of made me sense that there's this um, bubbling underneath society at the moment where, you know, maybe a lot of it's unspoken mm -hmm. as well. And I think back um, you know, my personal journey as well. Unpacking it all now, I think it could have even started around 216, you know, for me, like nearly eight years. Um, you know, you build these stories and narratives about yourself over a long period of time. And it's almost like things slowly catch up on you. You know, it's like these incremental small steps um, get you to a point and you actually don't realise you're at a point uh, in time and, you know, you start, you start kind of reflecting upon that. And I know Rachel will probably share it from a, 
household perspective, but, you know, being an entrepreneur has been an absolute gift. I mean, I, I've, I feel so fortunate and I think part of, part of that is that there's a guilt when you even put your hand up to say that you, you, you're suffering or struggling because people are like, well, how on earth, why would you be struggling with all of that? So firstly, I'm just super grateful of my life. I've got a beautiful wife. I've got three amazing children. I've got great friends. Um, I've had the highs and I've had the lows of life with all of it. So it's definitely not poor me, which actually makes it even worse when you start reflecting on these things. And um, I just kind of remember, um, you know, the the pressure of being an entrepreneur is the gift, but but it starts to take its toll over a long period of time. And I know that there are a lot of people who have reached out to me have kind of, you know, um, kind of resembled that as well. So, you know, I guess some of the traits that actually happened along that journey is, um, you know, o- over a long period of time, you know, you take on responsibility, which is yours. You build companies. Um, you feel a deep responsibility for your team as they come on. Um, you know, you've got these stories about yourself around this deep responsibility. Um, mine is around ethics and values, uh, which may be more of a trade-off for myself than for others. And then, you know, I, I found myself, you know, in 2021, actually going and getting some blood tests, which Rach made me do. I've had probably more stool tests than most human beings on the planet <laughs> um, and uh, and came back and I, I remember the, the test came back and said they didn't even know how I was functioning in the morning. And what really became evident at that stage as well as I was um, doing a lot of running and even doing marathons and that was really to kind of increase my cortisol levels in the morning. I was only surviving based on going for my runs, doing gym, which was really kind of getting me um, out of bed. Then kind of as you kind of fast forward through, you know, the journey, it started to permeate in other ways where I would um, feel like vomiting every morning before waking up and actually did vomit sometimes as well. Um, Started to become a lot more irritable at home probably poured that extra glass of wine at different times as well uh, and then worked my way through to um, this desperation of feeling like no one really understood how I was feeling at that stage and I just wanted to be in a hospital bed and at that stage people then would actually realise how I'm not coping with all of this and then you started trying to share it with people and you don't you can't really articulate it and you then people get a few attaboys, you know, you'll, you'll be right. You can kind of get through all of this. Uh, and then you just feel hopeless. Um, and then you just start managing. And then you've just got this story that you talk about saying, um, you know, these are the times that define us. And, uh, and if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. You got to keep pushing through. Mm. And then your body starts to start um, giving you these signs. You don't listen to it and and into the end you can't get out of bed, (laughs) which is kind of led to it. So um, if it wasn't for Rach um, and and having a partner that we've been together for nearly 30 years, um, you've seen the the best and and, and the worst. I've kept up appearances and uh, through all those times and, you know, you're the one that kind of pushed me to go and get some support, which I just, I can't believe how grateful I am to have you in my life. Um, I mean, for you throughout that time, it must, you know, it was challenging too, right? Just from a household perspective. Yeah, I guess from, you know, said 2021, but 2016 really for me, like a a marker. Um, When we were on a road trip and I can't remember the, how you were feeling, it would have been really similar to now. But I remember saying you need to go somewhere and get some help. That was so, and I actually said you need to go to Aroha, which was an amazing wellness retreat in New Zealand, and you were driving and just went almost zombie-like. And then we booked those tickets and it was a bit of a Band-Aid effect, but, you know, it was just something. And then you did that the second year, 2017. And, yeah, the, um, the, your work rate is intense. It, like it always has been and it just really seems to amplify, you know, with every business that you do. And, you know, I guess me with sort of all the different health anxieties that I have, I'm trying to fix things and so incessantly 
try to, you know, fix you and stool tests and blood tests and, yeah, 2021, you can sort of skip to that. You sort of get these results that say, you know, your cortisol's so high, how are you functioning? And then, you know, starts again with what to do. But, you know, you still push through even though it's, you know, take time off, take time off, you know, you, you can't because you've got all this responsibility for business and people that you care so deeply about, family being number one. And, um, yeah, you keep pushing and pushing and pushing. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, it was a definitely a challenge. And I, and I, I think the crescendo of all of it actually was um, when I went on that father-daughter camp with Nella and you think you're holding it all together. And, you know, I remember it was, absolutely bucketing down and you weren't and jumping that, out the door I wasn't I know <laughs> and it. I know it's true you pushed me out the door and said come on and uh I was on the the two stretcher beds uh in this tent as it was bucketing down and Nella said to me uh look dad can I talk to you about something and I said oh, of course you know sweetheart what, what do you want to chat to you about and she goes you know you're not well she said uh you 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 I know you're, you're trying to be happy dad but you sick and I'm worried. Mm. And at that stage, I'm like, you know, if you've got a two-year-old daughter and, and Rachel's just talked about your anxiety around health, uh, our, you know, Nella had had cancer when she was two, mm. um, you know, it, it turned our life upside down. And then for her at 12 to then be sitting me down, I just thought, you know, my behaviour in the house or how I am showing up is affecting people and I know it's created tension in the house um, but also it, it's actually you're being selfish. I mean if you're not being able to turn up the right way, you're not turning up for your team properly, you're trying to um, avoid different meetings, you've got shareholders who have actually put in money into a business as well and you, you feel like you, you're going to be letting them down as well. So as much as you know, it's a, it's a selfish thing where you get to a point where you can't move forward. The effects on family and the effects on people around you is actually the thing which you, you need to kind of reflect upon uh, as much as your own health, I think, anyway. But it was a, it was a, it, it was, it was challenging at that time. Even at the dinner table, I know I was being a pain in the backside at times. And you're just hyper focused on making sure everyone was, you know, not chewing loudly and <laughs> using knives and forks correctly. Mm. And um, you know, I think it was as you said, the the symptoms, you know, you saying every morning you're wanting to vomit um before you get out of bed, um, you know, that furious exercise in the morning. It became a not negotiable to, you know, get up and make sure you had that run in to then function throughout the day. And when we understood with the blood test, that was your cortisol spike to get on with it. Um yeah, just, um, yeah, the irritability, you know, fatigue, exhaustion, you know, definitely then flows through, you know, to the mm. rest of the family, mm. even though you don't realise mm. it at the time. It's all just sort of self-preservation, mm. I think, for everyone trying to sort of cope. But, you know, on the flip side, you know, you're so selfless and wanting to make sure everyone's cared for and you're still showing up and, you know, you're juggling both sides of the the coin. I think it's a well-worn area and I think, you know, the the gift was um, when we were in the Northern Rivers and um, you said, okay, time for another stool test. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, oh, all right, here we go again. Another infection. Another one. <laughs> and um, I was uh, then we went and, you know, saw a, a GP at the Health Lodge um, which I spent a lot of time last year, an amazing place yeah. to, you know, with so many fantastic practitioners. And, yeah, I, was like, I took Ryan in, said, blood test, you need an ECG. And then I started looking at um, work burnout clinics, realised there was a huge psychological piece around that. Like why do you feel the need to work as you do? It goes back, you know, stems back. Well, everyone can look at that, I guess. Mm. And then obviously I'd heard there was an exceptional psychologist at the health lodge that was really, really busy. And I know that there was sort of, um, you know, every week you could sort of present people. And so I said to, you know, um, the GP, please present Ryan because I really feel if Simon hears the story, he might see Ryan. And then 
Thank goodness you did. <laughs> yeah, we got to do some good work together. Uh, and, and I think for me it was a, a, a turning point, Simon, and, again, I'm just deeply grateful because sometimes you can chat to people but um, I, and th- I had to feel like there was a connection there as well where I could, you know, I've kept up a facade for so long and an identity that I've kind of invested in to be able to drop that down and be able to kind of speak openly to the heart of what the issue is. And you just don't realize it just kind of builds all through your life and then to kind of work through all of that. But I mean, what are you seeing at the moment, Simon, Mm -hmm. when it, when it comes to burnout, um, the, the, the challenge of that. And I guess, the society at the moment, do you see there's an increase in it or is it just people are talking about it more or mm. what? what's your view on that? Yeah, so a couple of things um, I'd like to touch on and, and about particularly the therapeutic space and why it's so helpful is because when we're living our lives and we're out in the world in our roles, we have to keep them up. I mean, I, I don't think we we can collapse. There are important roles we have as as parents, as as people who are working, as people in our community who are doing things. But the one place you can let go of those roles and speak into the distress and the vulnerability is in that therapeutic space. And we were really fortunate, you know, there was a good synergy there. So uh, Ryan and I could get started uh, really, really quickly and really well. But I certainly invite people that, you know, the first place to start when you're when you're looking at this, you don't think you're doing too well, is finding that space and to keep looking around until you find the one that kind of really fits. Um, you know, trust your, trust your instincts on that. Um, to your other question about kind of broadly what's going on, it was interesting to go back to um, kind of the research that had been done and in particular through the University of, of New South Wales with Gabriella Tavella and Gordon Parker and Ren, you had the, the fortunate opportunity to see Gordon talk. Um, but burnout is, is particularly... Uh, present in our society as a consequence of the pandemic. That's why there has been such a focus because the level of stress on all of us through that time and as the legacy from that time is still present, it was a time where work and home and the big questions about what was going to happen to our lives was just all crushed in. So people in uh, spaces of very high responsibility as well, Um, you know, that was an unsettling period, um, let alone uh, thinking about our well-being and the well-being of our family. So uh, that's one factor that uh, Ren reminded me of as we were flying here that we're still moving out of. Um, I actually think it'll take about 10 years before we really process what's happened. So we're two years down the track. So I do believe we've got another good eight years for it to be far enough away from the event where we can really safely start unpacking what's occurred globally. So I think it's a journey. Another element I think, Ryan, and it's uh, what I really like um, about the way that you think because you think uh, systemically, you think uh, systems, uh, you also think philosophically as well. And, you know, there's important questions to ask about how our society and how our systems generate expectations about what's a normal way to work or I might do the little rabbit ears, what's a normal way to work and, in fact, what is actually a healthy way to work for our neurophysiology and our bodies and what are the sorts of things that are making available to us within our communities around food and fresh air and and connection with, with family and people to keep that neurophysiology healthy and there's some important questions to ask around that because uh, like the book Myth of Normal, yes. um, which uh, we've had an opportunity to read by Gabo Mate, uh, those systems are asking things of us that uh, our bodies and minds can't necessarily keep up with. So there's some big systemic questions there as well. It's interesting because, you know, I think one of the areas when coming to you is that I felt like I didn't know if there was something wrong either, like you, it, it's funny, you, mm. it's almost like you're thinking to yourself, oh, am I trying to give myself a trap door? 
Like, you know, but I'm feeling this way. I don't know why I'm feeling this way. Um, and maybe even the way that you get brought up, it's kind of like you just got to push through, mm. right? I and shouldn't feel this I way. I shouldn't feel Everybody this way. Else is kind of- it's a guilt for mm. feeling that way. And it was like the more that you suppress it, it mm. felt like the body started to give signals <laughs> along the way to you kind of have to listen to it mm. as well. So from a, from a, what what are when people are thinking about burnout? You know, what are the, what are some of the systemic traits that start to permeate? Mm. Do you think? Yeah, so I, mean, I think this is a really great lead in for all of us to talk about. Um, and I want to reference um, an article that you put up on LinkedIn, which started the conversation, which was called "Trade Offs: Ambitions Versus Redlining." And you ask the question, when do we realise we've pushed ourselves too far? You know, when do we redline? When are we redlining? And it's such an important question. And you got two responses, both of which I thought were really good. One was from a woman called Nithya and she said, while we understand the principles of work-life balance and self-care, we often overlook them because they aren't as visible as deadlines, commitments and achievements. If a once joyful job becomes burdensome, it's a clear sign to reprioritise, reassess your environment, reset your goals. But I think the most important point she made was your mind and body are sending a vital message. Heed it. Yes. And then uh, Pete Hunt mm. uh, said a similar thing, which I thought was just right on point. Hey, Ryan, when I have pushed it too far, I feel it from my gut. We need to feel to heal. And if it feels off, it's off. But this is based on a really important premise, and that is we're noticing and feeling what our body's doing mm. and recognising that that's something that's not okay or there's something wrong. That's a bit tricky. Um, so there can be an easier way to do it, and that's do a questionnaire. <laughs> <laughs> so, There's always, it's a, always, oh, always, a, always. Yeah. Well, Ryan, you um, in your last podcast, you uh, the participants, you asked them to go away and do yeah. a blood test. Yes. So there are ways that we can get information which help us make these assessments about our health, and you know within the space of psychology, um, we do a questionnaire. It's a bit more tricky because you can fudge a psychological questionnaire. Mm. You can't really fudge a blood test. So you have to be you yes. have to be honest. Um, but Gordon Parker and his associates, again coming out of that uh, the, the COVID space, uh, put together the Sydney burnout measure. Yes. Uh, you can download that from my website if you like. If you just put in Simon Dubois Psychology yes. and go to my online assessments page, you can get it from there. Uh, and and we did we all did that assessment together before coming on here. Uh, and it gives you a really, you know, a helpful understanding of whether you're moving towards burnout or in fact in burnout. It's interesting. And, and Ren, like, you know, you're a – amazing in your own professional life as well. And I was just kind of looking at that. I mean, you, your your ability to kind of understand the intricacies of the human system and, and the way that you obviously being a naturopath and even looking at chronic health conditions of others and taking all that on, you know, so you've got this view from a health perspective, but also you've burnt out mm. over the time as well, which is just remarkable. I mean, that's well, crazy because I'm a health professional, <laughs> right? I should get this stuff, and I'm married to a psychologist, so I should really get it. Um, but no, we're all vulnerable to it. We're all susceptible. Um, and would you like me to share? Yeah, it'd be fantastic. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so I've burnt out twice. Uh, the first time I burnt out, it was about 2013. And I was just doing a ridiculous amount of things. Um, I was a mother of two. I had a 10-year-old and a 13-year-old and they were the centre of my universe. Um, but I was running a clinic full time. So and I had a patient load of probably about two to 300 active patients Excellent. at the time. Um, I was uh, establishing my first integrative medical practice. So I had, a I had a doctor that had allowed me into his practice and he said, yeah, run it, Ren, go for it. So I did because I could. Um, and it's this thing with entrepreneurs, you know, we're, we're just, we're so capable yeah. and we can see what can be done. But not only that, we can follow through and we can organise them. And so it's, it's a very powerful gift. It's an incredible superpower to have, but it can be our undoing as yeah. well. 
Um, so I was running integrative retreats. I was renting houses, bringing guests in, running a whole team of carers and chefs and practitioners and bringing them all together and doing team meetings with them. I was um, inviting international speakers to Byron Bay and I was running lectures with, you know, um, up to between 100 and 150. So I had all these guests coming into town that I had to house and presenters that I was bringing from overseas and making sure it was all financially viable. At the same time, I was developing a business plan for what I was calling developing the integrative hospital. And um, I was also in negotiations with New South Wales Health because I wanted to take over the old Byron Hospital. Mm. You can kind of hear what's going on here. This is a ridiculous (laughs) amount of stuff to be doing. Um, And then, you know, my relationship with Simon wasn't great. We were really struggling. So there wasn't a lot of really good communication there with what was going on. And really the question is, why was I doing so much? Yeah. Why was I not seeing? Oh, and I was, yeah, I was running a, a lecture series for um, a, one of the nutraceutical companies. They're testing hair mineral analysis. So I was flying interstate every weekend running these lectures. Wow. So just when I look back, I go, no, that's ridiculous. I can't believe I did that. But I could. And so I did. Yeah. And, you know, we all suffered. The children suffered. Um, our relationship suffered. And if we're being vulnerable, you know, we, we picked it apart. Um, there was a couple of the things that I had to do. So, uh, oh, and then I had an operation and um, to have a melanoma removed. Of course, if you're working that hard, you're going yeah. to get cancer and it got infected. So, of course, if you're working that hard, your immune system doesn't work so well. Yep. I am going to get a systemic strep infection and I landed up in bed. So I was 12 months in oh, bed. God. Wow. And, you know, there was many signs along the way that because I was such a master at denial and dissociation from my childhood traumas, it was really easy for me to ignore them. And, you know, I remember days Cy was dropping me at work and I was going, I'm just so tired. I'm just so, so deeply tired. And Cy would kind of look at me like I'd gone wah, 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 wah. And I'd kind of hop out of the car and I'd kind of get into clinic and... It well, was, we're pulling it apart a bit in the plane coming here, weren't we? Yeah. That, you know, I was I was in a place of resentment that you were so busy and not available yeah. rather than actually also, seeing that you were just absolutely exhausted. Yeah. So we'd we'd both sort of got into a place of, you know, the you know, the competition of who's suffering most. Yeah. And uh, not really being available to care for each other. So, you yeah. know, it gets it gets this these spaces get quite fraught. Do, do you think yeah, that you can look at absolutely. it now and you just you know, even just in circles, you know, turning fifty soon, there's a lot of divorce and oh, yeah. um relationship breakdowns. And you know, Rachel and I will be nearly thirty years and you know you've got to continue to work at it, you know, and you start to kind of Create your own independent lives around your own silos. Yeah, mm. just trying to cope with the stresses of life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then you, so if you don't, you, uh, you know, there is a systemic issue of busyness yes. around of it. And then I guess the question becomes: and did you kind of work through that? Why do we do what we do? Like, well, what I had we, to. Yeah, I had and to. And where did that lead you? So, well, there was a few things I did. So, first of all, I put down all of the projects except clinic. And so I would sleep for four days and work for three. But I would get home from work and I'd say to the kids, sorry, honey, I can't cook dinner tonight. I just have to get up into my bed now. I'm spent. I've spent what I had for the day. And I would work myself up to be able to get through to the next week, to be able to do those three days in clinic because I felt very responsible financially. Um, And it's part of my poverty consciousness Mm. that, you know, I have to provide for my family. And, um, but diet, cleaned up diet, started exercising, yoga, breath work. Um, I started getting weekly acupuncture, weekly intravenous vitamins. And there was this little part of me going, oh God, I hope this stuff works. You know, I prescribe it all day long, but you know, I'm on the front line here and I have to use this stuff. So I really hope it works, but I still wasn't getting results. So no alcohol, no coffee. Um, So then I started doing some kinesiology and found, you know, I had this pattern of martyrdom. You know, I, I just, I had to be at service at all costs. And I was groomed from a very young age to be a martyr um, through, you know, religious afflictions in both sides of the family um, and my poor mother. And, um, you know, there was the trauma history. There's the ACE questionnaire, the... Adverse childhood, childhood events. events. Which I score quite high on, mm. uh, which was a shock when I did that questionnaire. I was like, oh, 
idea. Sai encouraged me to do it one day because his brother, my brother had done it. And when he told me my brother's score, I was like, no, 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 we had the same childhood. (laughs) And then when I did it, I got one higher than him and I was like, oh, my God, okay. And so, you know, there's societal expectations that have to be looked at. There's being a woman in today's society, you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you're a woman, you've got to turn up and some because Mm. you're a woman. Um, And then there's the perfectionism thing, which I've only just recently done that question. And that was one of the ones Gordon Parker just added to the Sydney burnout questionnaire because he recognised there was a a type that is more susceptible to burnout. And I scored high on that as well. And when I started the questionnaire, I said to Sai, no, I'm not a perfectionist. I'm definitely not a perfectionist. So I was shocked again that I scored high on that questionnaire. I was going to say, you've got a saying that you've used on me many times, stop (laughs) soaring sawdust. (laughs) When I'm like digging and digging and just trying to get to the, you know, this perfect thing or I leave no stone unturned. (laughs) Stop soaring sawdust. Well, that's, well, that's what's happening as well is that, you know, you, even if you just go through LinkedIn, you know, you've just got the humble brags, you know, and I've, I've been, I've done them, you know, and, you know, everyone's sharing the best of their life, you know, where even health spam at the moment, like the perfect routine, mm. the ultimate biohack, mm. you know, all these mm. different things of trying to get absolute mm. perfection mm. in how we work through it. I mean, you know, so when you... If someone's, um, Ren, thank you for sharing that too as well. And and I guess from a, a physical perspective as as well, Simon. You know, if if someone's listening at the moment as well, and they're thinking, okay, what's what's the right approach? How do I actually engage with a a, psych, a psychologist? And what's the purpose of actually seeing a psychologist? Because mm. sometimes, you know this vulnerability of going in and speaking to someone like, oh, I've just got to go and spill my guts and, you know, then they're going to unpack me and find some childhood trauma and then pack me up and send me back out into the world again. Mm. But can you kind of run through like the process of, you know, getting asked the right questions and 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 w- what's the real value of, of working with a psychologist? Yeah, look, I think the first one is, um, you know, as, as dry as it is, is kind of making an assessment because as individuals we're kind of making our best guess guesses uh, or perhaps we've got lots of people kind of giving advice or, you know, perhaps we're just trying not to think about it. But when we're trying to work things out, often on our own because they're things that we don't want to share, under load in our own minds and bodies, that's, that's a pretty complicated space to do it. So at its most fundamental, it's about being able to share that information and create some coherence out of it. Like just, just, and I go, oh, okay. If I take that all out of my head where it's just all a jumble or perhaps I can't, can't connect to it very well, I've, I've got a collaborator where we are making sense of this experience together, mm. just making sense of it. And then it's like, all right, well, what's our, What's our pathway? Uh, you know, it might be fairly nuts and boltsy and it might be, okay, great, I've got lots of bad habits. Mm. Let's Now that we've identified those, what's the, some plans I can replace them with? It could be nuts and boltsy as that. Or it can be, you know, what are my drivers? Like Ren was mentioning, um, you know, these drivers that would push me into helping people so many people way more than I need to at the expense of my own health. Like what's the driver there? And just to kind of have a clear understanding, it's kind of like, I mean, you know, I think we reach that space every now and then. It's like, oh, (laughs) yeah, okay, yeah, of course. (laughs) It's so true. It's so like getting anchoring um, and even Rachel and I were laughing on on the car on the way in as well is that, you know, these beha- these self limiting behaviors that creep into your life you know and and for me it was uh, a a deep sense of responsibility for others and as much as that sounds like a virtue it it's a trade off for me in one way or another mm-hmm. and it and it always has an origin as well back to a, a, an event or when you're younger and i always was thought oh yeah but then when you actually find that event <laughs> Right, and you contextualise it when you start behaving in a specific way again 
at least it gives you an anchor to say, oh, I'm doing that again. And I remember this kind of Mm. responsibility for others would prevent me from allowing conflict at certain times, even within the workplace, trying to, you know, make sure everyone's feeling right at the same time. Or even, Rach, when we had my family over, I'd be like... Trying to make sure everyone was having the most perfect time, just this huge sense of responsibility for you know, making sure everyone was looked after to the nth degree, whereas Mm. I was just, you know, we've we've done everything possible, just let everyone get to the door and show up as themselves and it will all work out and everyone will have a great time. But that wasn't enough. No. And you're you're getting your guts in a guts in a knot. So I think (laughs) when you're working through a process then, Simon, how important is kind of getting to the heart of your identity and the reasons you behave the way you behave mm. and, and and is there a framework that you work with with people to get to that stage or how does that work? How does the magic work? I just yeah. sit in the chair and I don't have to worry about this stuff. I just kind of relax into it. But. You were self-reflecting really quickly. I can remember even after the first couple yeah, right. of sessions for Ryan, you would pick yourself up mm. and your, um, yeah, you would, it's like the, the, the light was shone on certain behaviours. You yeah. know, would obviously whatever magic you were working really, yeah. really the behaviors really. you've been telling me for years, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> minor detail, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, look, it depends on a number of things, time and place, and you know, on some level, it's it's not essential at times either. You know, yes. it's like I just want to make that really clear to people that would go see a counselor, a therapist, the psychologist. It's it's not necessarily going to be that work, but you know you're kind of uh, you know preaching to the converted yes. here. I think it's a great thing to do. I think it's a great thing to understand your origin story, and understand the the things that have influenced us and been very very influential when we're young, because they tend to develop patterns in the way that we participate. In the world, yes, uh, and towards ourselves. Uh, so there's just uh, there's just so much uh, power in that. Given you know, for example, I mean, one of the things that we really think about in the psychological context that there are there are these inner drivers um, within internal family systems therapy, which is uh, very popular at the moment. We know that there are a, a lot of parts. We're not just a one I. I am Simon. I've got lots of parts. I've got a part that, you know, really likes to socialise with people. I've got a part that really doesn't. Uh, I've got a part that wants to achieve, but I've got a part that's really nervous about it and kind of wants to keep away from that sort of thing. So, but often these parts are very protective. Uh, So, you know, in the entrepreneurial kind of space, like you mentioned, Ren, there's, there's a there's a part that's trying to protect you from poverty mm. and it kind of goes, Ren, don't stop. Mm. Shit, if you stop, uh, you might mm. not experience, you might have that experience again of not much money. You, you don't want that. You're not going to cope. So we'll just keep you working. Mm. Um, when we have awareness of, of these parts that really push us, we can then start having a dialogue with them and go, hey, it's, it's okay. You know, we're not six. Yes. We're actually kind of 50 now. <laughs> <laughs> is that the ego driving that? You know, you're saying that. I mean, that's the ego so saying, yeah, keep working. What, what's yeah, the we use we thought? use different terms, but, you know, one of them can be, you know, the ego is is driving it. But often, you know, whether it's the ego or a protective, uh, a protective part, mm. uh, the driver ostensibly is just to try and make sure we're okay in the world and make sure that we don't re-experience things that we did in the past that mm. may well have been and actually were very threatening or have the risk of being very threatening. But yeah. again, these protective parts forget to take into account our current age, how skilled we actually are, the sorts of resources that are available yeah. to us in our life now. So what the therapeutic space does is help our whole system understand that our circumstances are very difficult. They're very different, I should say. And so the sorts of fears that we've got don't necessarily need to drive us anymore. It's fascinating. And And Sai, also with the IFS, the um, the internal family systems work, um, part of the treatment that I underwent for burnout was we needed to do couples counselling and really look at those those drivers. parts of ourselves, those drivers, because they're also in relationship 
mm. with each other as well. And so they're showing up in relationships. So, you know, the little part of me that's super, super worried about poverty, you know, is is um, ticking some of size internal family systems. And so they're kind of at war. There's these parts of us that are at war. And then, then there's these parts that truly love and admire and respect each other. And so the therapeutic process really does help in couples counselling as well to identify those roles and so when they come out we can go oh that's your little poverty one <laughs> yeah. super scared that she's gonna not have any electricity and yeah. and so it's it's a powerful tool for individuals but yeah. for couples as well and and empathy just piece. Add, yeah it really piece. brings empathy it brings empathy, empathy to yourself yeah. and yeah. it brings empathy to other people yeah. uh, but I think in particular again uh, around the vulnerability piece which you know mm. I, I see Ryan has been a big communication that you've been giving to people through through this communication, uh, being kind to ourselves is so important. Yeah, mm. yeah, it is. It's amazing, you know. Um, a couple of things you're just saying, Renaud. I'd also love to hear in a moment. Just we we're talking about it from a psychological perspective, but how does that permeate to a physical? Right from inflammation, mm. like what does it do to our body? So as much as you know. Um, the way that we behave, the way that we project ourselves to the world, the self, the self limiting, and the stress that we create. Mm. Can you just kind of explain? You know, we, we've we've got these incre- increases in cortisol, our dopamine, all these different areas within it. Inflammation, you know, being at the heart of so much disease. From your professional perspective. You know, someone's listening, going, "Yeah, I've got all these traits psychologically, but what is happening physically to us?" Psychological, it's different for everyone, and we are complex beings. There's sort of no one picture. As we'd have identified burnout long ago, yes. um, and so interestingly, your picture, you know, that cortisol was through the roof, but you didn't gain weight. So for some people, they would have just packed the weight on, no matter how much they were moving, and then they would have started getting joint issues. Um, because cortisol displaces insulin. And so when insulin's displaced, sugar can't get into the cells for energy. So that's where the fatigue part yeah. comes in. People will often experience deep, deep fatigue. Yes. Um, but then that knock-on effect of cortisol being high for so long in women will really displace the hormones. And the glands that get most affected are the adrenals. They're the ones that produce all this cortisol, but the thyroid gland as well. And what I see in clinic is most people have not had a full thyroid workup. The um, current theory is if your TSH is in anywhere between 0 or 0.3 and 3.6, I think they've just broadened the, narrowed the range a little bit, you're okay. I would say the range is still grossly underestimated. And if you're anywhere between 1 and 2, tick, Mm. but even 2.2, 2.3, there should be a full thyroid investigation. So this gland is what governs energy. And it's sort of the, um, it's the treasurer of our endocrine system. And that guy gets taken out pretty heavily. Mm. Um, And then as women, we've got all this estrogen that we're dealing with. Menopause is one of the best things that happened to me. I'm so glad that estrogen journey is over because I can be more male-like in the mm. world now. I don't have this surging estrogen and then there's dropping estrogen. So the roller coaster ride is over, thank mm. goodness. Mm. But when it's on, it's just one other thing that the poor liver has to metabolise. And that's why things like alcohol and coffee, um, pollution, uh, plastics in our environment, they're all really contributing as well. So once the system's in overload and we've lost our neuroresilience, we have to work pretty hard to get it back. Uh, a couple of nutrients, vitamin D, super, mm. super important for neuroinflammation. And that's what we're talking about. Inflammation is a very broad term for disease. All disease has an inflammatory basis. Um, but neuroinflammation is what burnout is. It's it's a loss of resilience of the nervous system, the neuro communicator of every organ in the body, the digestive system being the biggest one yes. of all. So that's why the vomiting um, quite often people will experience diarrhea. Yep. So that's Check. another yeah, really big one. And then you go <laughs> and get stool as well. test. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> stool test after stool test. Which makes it harder and, when you've got diarrhea or constipation. Well, the lovely thing is when they come back, and I am fond of a stool test, right, yes. <laughs> um, is when they come back normal. Yes. And you go, okay, 
It's not a parasite. It's not an inflammatory bowel disease. Um, you know, you're metabolizing your food. Um, this has to be coming from the nervous system mm. because it is the next system above the digestive system that innovates into it, the vagal nervous system in particular. And it's a beautiful big um, uh, pathway of nerves that go down from the ears through the throat, uh, down through the heart, through the stomach and the bowel. And then there's a little bit of talk about it going down the back of the legs where the sciatica nerve goes, mm. but not, we're not quite sure if that's um, fact yet or not. Um, but that nervous system gets taken out pretty badly. And um, Cy does a lot of work with polyvagal therapy as well. But we have got some other modalities that I frequently use for people in burnout. Vagal nerve stimulation. I love craniosacral therapy. I mean, this is why I run teams because yeah. I know it's not just about diet and lifestyle and nutrients like vitamin D and iron and magnesium. Yes. All super, super important. Um, but it's about supporting that nervous system to get its tone back to get its resilience back and um, that's that's the big part of the neurochemistry it's amazing because you think mm -hmm. that a lot of the time we people would be approaching it from, from a pharma, pharmaceutical perspective right like SS, SSRIs for because we're now in you know depression or these types of things and it's really interesting because when you're saying about the nervous system you know, my, my nervous system felt so unregulated and it's not the event that tips you. It's, it could be a small event that tips you over, but it's a kind mm. of, it's a bit like having a glass full of water. And I don't even know if I said this, I'd find myself just crying at certain stages and I, I couldn't watch a Kleenex dog ad on TV. <laughs> I was mm. like, I know it sounds mm. so stupid mm. and that's probably mm. a poor example of it, but it's, you know, you, it just felt like it was just so unregulated. And then, again, bringing that home, Rach, you know, the, the smaller things at home would tip you off and that's that's not fair. Uh, yeah, your resilience on, was low. Your resilience mm. on other things, whereas you were resilient maybe at work or doing a capital raise or dealing with it. And I remember catching up with you, Simon, my whole point was we set a plan to say, okay, Let's just, let's just make sure that we've got a path for 12 months to make sure that you can manage your way through. And then I remember that day when after the event with Nella kind of coming in and chatting and just saying, my, my, my face is blown up, my eyes mm, have gone, mm, the body's mm, now mm, kind mm. of saying, I don't think I actually can go that bit mm. further. And then you start catastrophizing. Mm. Like it's sometimes that you start fearing what are other people going to think now? And yeah. and you start playing all these movies in your head and I guess, you know, and then you can see why now and because of your your body's reacting in one way. And it's giving and, us symptoms constantly. It's yeah. giving us signals constantly. But those of us with a really strong will can just ignore that. Correct. Yeah. Mm. Or you can take a Nurofen yeah. or, <laughs> yeah. you know, you can have another glass of wine or you well, can have a second in. coffee. Because the wine balanced you out and I mm. bet there's a lot of people listening at home and, you know, you have that one glass of wine, it takes the edge off it. Yep. You can shift gears. You can shift gears and then you, you're chasing the feeling of the first one with the second one or maybe the third one. Right, and then you go to bed, you don't have a great night's sleep, you wake up again, you then try and fix it in some other way, and it just becomes this slippery slope. And I know a lot of my mates have turned to alcohol and drugs because of it. Well, coming back to the myth of normal, it's normal. Once your nervous system's kind of in that state, it's completely normal to go to the pub or get a six-pack or you know, have the wine over dinner or two or three, but it's acceptable in our society to manage our distress in that way, which makes it, you know, it makes it really hard. It, it makes it very difficult. I mean, I'm, I'm shocked at the extent to which we cope with not doing some things now and not drinking at all is relatively new. Mm. Uh, however, I, th I think five, ten years ago, you know, I just wouldn't have been able to pull it off. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you are very committed to trying to do that and your system's very driven to do that, it, that's difficult, isn't it, with just the availability of of acceptable ways of, of regulating, which are really just these kind of stop gaps to, to get you going the next day but not really kind of honouring the well-being of your body or your nervous system. Yeah. It was the first yeah. time I think I'd seen you using alcohol as a relaxant. Yeah. Mm. Come out of the... 
the room after a day of Zoom and and then, um, yeah, the, that beautiful bowl of red was there that you sort of almost like, oh. Yeah. You know, just to it have was that, almost that a reward glass. to bookend. It's almost become ceremonial like your coffee in the morning, you yeah. know. Yeah. It's like, oh, I'll bookend it at the end of the day and then, you know, I know, and you said to me at that in the end, you, you know, in the end, the end was pretty much you got to pull up, mate. It, to, yeah. to be honest, and because mm. you wouldn't really partake in it, it almost become like an isolating, all right, I'm going to have a glass of wine. You go, oh, I don't really feel like one. I think if we both had have gone knee deep into it, it might, <laughs> yeah. have, it might have been a bit of an if issue. It was red. I'm not a big red drinker. I don't think it was Chardonnay yeah. where we had an extra couple. I think the most, one of the alarming things, you, you mentioned it really early in the piece, was that you wish that you could – be in hospital so you could just be left alone. Mm. Like that was a big driver when that was one of, you know, a wish for you, which it did actually did happen. You yes. have malaria. Mm. Um, yeah. You were living in Indonesia. You contracted malaria. We all did the same activities, but Ryan left and contracted malaria and then you ended up in Sri Lanka in hospital. Yeah. Mm. And that was actually a haven a for you oh. because he said, I just got left alone and mm. people sort of believed that there was something wrong mm. and you just got space and peace. And I was yeah. like, wow, you know, to have yeah. to really go to, important. to that sort of length yeah. to mm. find your peace. Mm. I wanted to kind of touch on the symptom picture, which is yeah, you know, primarily so. uh, psychological and, again, uh, the the Sydney uh, burnout uh, measure um, collates this. So it's really good to look at. Um this particular symptom is is one of them is, you know, withdrawing and becoming insular, um, obviously impaired work performance. But the work, uh, the World Health Organisation recognises it as a, as a syndrome. It's not a, mm-hmm. it's not a psychological uh, disorder. Um, but interesting in that recognition of uh, it being a, a associated with work and a work syndrome, uh, this recent research is acknowledging uh, that domestic duties are work, uh, caring for other people uh, is work, and so um, people in that situation are susceptible to burnout as well. It's not just you know purely the entrepreneur executive; uh, other people are susceptible uh, to this as well. Uh, unsettled mood uh, is another. Uh, exhaustion, which was the one you were really speaking to, Ren. Just again, how the biological system really struggles. Uh, Cognitive symptoms mm. uh, and another really interesting one, loss of empathy. Mm. Um, you know, the, the people that you kind of worked with and really valued or, but you know, perhaps it's, you know, our partner, uh, all of a sudden the empathy's kind of dropped and mm. just sort of in survival. It's, um, well, I think part of the podcast is to, you know, simplify and and kind of demystify burnout and I think a lot of the time, Burnout has been considered like you know, and I, I and I'm going to own this as well is that it was like physically, it, mentally weak. I know, and that, that sounds horrible to actually say out loud now. Um, it's like, Ooh. yeah, it, it, mm-hmm. it, and it, but it's real, and um, and it's taken me a while because the other thing is when I was chatting to you, Simon, I was I wanted to make sure that I was, this is not a cop out. Like mm-hmm. I needed to stress test it. In, in every area um, and still I feel shame a bit, to be honest. I feel that I have let a lot of people down um, in, in a number of ways and I need to continue to work through all of that, which is which is an interesting one. But as part of that, so we've simplified part of the, the challenge now around demystifying it. We've socialised this now and kind of discussed um you know, some of the symptoms, hopefully people that are watching or listening today, you know, they know that this is okay, right? This is something that does happen. Um, and I guess the next part of it is what do we do, right? So that's the start part of this now. If people are in a situation at the moment, and I had some messages from people and everyone will know who are listening to this um, in some desperation, like I'm feeling this, and I've had people that have you know, have been got really sick over this as well. How do people move forward? What are the steps um, from this point? What can somebody do um, that is listening at the moment to start kind of supporting themselves through this and maybe start with you, mate? Yeah. Um, Well, I guess the first thing that we've been talking about is acknowledging it 
and and taking it on and kind of being fair to yourself. And if it still doesn't kind of feel clear to you um, or any of the listeners, um, see what the question there says. Yes. Um, and if it indicates that, you know, you you're really under load, that stress has affected you and caused caused injury, then take that seriously. It's interesting you use the word injury. Yeah, I use it a lot more uh, therapeutically because we, we get that if we fall off our skateboard, we get injured. Yes. You know, we, we, we get that if we're in a car accident, we get injured. Well, if we're in a workplace that's highly, highly demanding, um, we could get injured. Mm. Um, if we've been um, kind of hothoused at home caring for kids and, you know, the elderly mum's kind of really sick and then, you know, another family member's got really sick, well, that level of stress associated with the responsibility can injure us. Mm. So it requires it requires attention. And, you know, coming back to what we've got clear with this conversation is recognising the injury. Yes. And if we're having trouble, which we can for various reasons, then um, let a let an assessment or let a health professional let you know. Um, if you're not sure, yes. uh, go front up to someone and say, say. The questionnaire is great because you can see facts and data and some what you can't see tangibly, you know, some mm. take a long time to pick up. You, know, yeah. you see a cut, like you said, you go, oh, okay, I need to fix that. But you can feel things for a really long time yeah. and not act on it. Mm. Absolutely. So if I was to add um, yes. where to start um, naturopathically, it's always the nervous system. Yeah. And um, sometimes patients are so unwell that they can't do the psychological, they can't see the psychological injury that's happened or continuing to happen because the nervous system has completely lost its resilience. So they're in, um, you know, dorsal bagel, they're just switched off cognitively. They can't actually work anything out. You were still cognitively able to, mm. to pick up the bits that were being worked out in your session, but some patients are beyond that as well with burnout. And um, so anything neuro, um, acupuncture, craniosacral therapy, massage. Yes. Massage is such a powerful tool that I think we underutilise. Um, intravenous vitamin C is a fantastic just nourishment for the whole system, systemic. Um, but if there was one place I would recommend people start, it's sleep. Get yes. your sleep mm. hygiene in place because that's where the brain takes rest and that's where the brain finds its reset for the day. And if we're drinking one or two glasses of wine before bed, mm. already we're going to shortcut our sleep processes. Yeah. If we're going to bed dehydrated, we're going to shortcut those processes. If we're bombarding ourselves with blue blue light yes. before we're trying to go oh, to God, sleep, yeah. mm. we're artificially messing with that circadian rhythm cycle. And there's a lot of research come out now about burnout and the place to start, and it's sleep. Clean up your sleep environment. Um, you know, herbs, there's beautiful herbs for sleep. My favourite one, uh, withania and magnolia, beautiful herbs. Uh, melatonin. Fantastic research out now about melatonin. They're actually doing the studies on super high doses. I'm not so sure about that bit. Yeah. Um, but just even a small dose, it is uh, an antioxidant for the brain. So it helps with neuroinflammation and it helps to reset that circadian rhythm. But there's a process called phase shifting. And that's where you... You can artificially tap into this circadian rhythm and you can do it with two things. You can do it with sleep-wake cycle and you can do it with times of the day that you eat. And because we have all these internal clocks and so if you set your alarm and say, right, I'm going to get up at 6.30 every day or 5.30 every day and I'm going to go to bed at 9.30. And that's actually the harder bit, not getting up. It's the getting in bed yes. by 9.30. And I'm going to do no blue light after five o'clock and I'm not going to eat any later than seven o'clock. They're powerful things we can do to reset the circadian rhythm cycle, which will reset neuroinflammation. So that's where I recommend that's starting. Amazing. Some, some yeah, great lessons great for tips. kids to, to take away from that as well. You just think yeah. about... That's a whole, I'm going to have to get you guys back on and just, I think we need to unpack pack that one for another day. But, and I think, and I, I guess, Rach, I guess from your perspective as well, and, and maybe last thing is like, we've been together since we were 20, you know, and like we are partners in all of this, yeah, you know, and it, we've, we've gone through the whole, the whole ups and downs and it's like, you're in a roller coaster, 
We were both in in <laughs> in, in the seats in in all of it. And I think if there hadn't have been you in my life, I don't know what honestly would have potentially happened. I think I just would have kept kind of going uh, and kind of um, driving myself. But if you were kind of if someone else was, I guess, listening at home as well, I mean, you just became an advocate and just wouldn't let go. I guess, is there any advice that you'd be giving out there as well? Yeah, good question. Um, I think it's like Rem was saying, you really need to get your own support and make sure that rather than, you know, you're trying to fix and you're trying to be that support, but to sort of hold the mirror up and go and get a massage go, you know, get that that self-care, which is this word that's, you know, used so much these days, but, mm. you know, you sort of put your own oxygen mask on. Yeah. Mm. Like really do that critically so then you can be there for everyone else because, yeah, it does take, it takes a toll, especially like an entrepreneurial life. There's the, the highs and the lows and oh. you ride them all with sort of gusto and, you know, you have this innate belief, you know, in life and its journey. But, yeah, it can take its toll, that's for sure. So I would say... Self care and listening to you about, you know, sleep and which is my big thing, you know, not getting enough sleep. It's making me think, right, I really have to get to bed early. <laughs> and yeah. There's another lovely sleep hack to uh, CBD. Yeah. It's just become on the mm. market. We can now prescribe it. Um, and those patients with chronic insomnia, years and years and years of chronic insomnia, one drop of THC, well placed before bed. And I've got people sleeping after years of trying everything. I've got them off the tamazepam, off the Valium, and yes. they're sleeping deeply, moving into REM sleep. Wow. And all the other health conditions are just starting to unravel. So it's Amazing. I think it's primary. If there's anything neurological or stress-related, you have to rescue that sleep pattern. It's yeah, I love so that. Good that. And it's free. Even... It's, yeah. yeah, you don't need to be going out to you know, researching and going <laughs> buy more supplements and, mm. you know, those ones that you said are a key. I completely agree. But you can go to bed yourself. Yeah. Well, we'll try and drag you there. Rachel, you're at night hour and, and all of this, but it's uh, – where it is. But So as we're kind of starting to wrap up now, is there anything else that you guys want to share that you think would be, would be valuable? And, and also potentially even someone finds themselves in the thick of it at the moment you know, and that they're starting to see some signs and they need to get into even to the right mindset. I mean, do you have any advice or thoughts around that? Well, I think um, what I'd like to share is that Simon and I are heading into uh, a very big workload over the next 12 months. So I guess you're making an important point that for a lot of the listeners, you can't avoid the Sometimes environment that can't. might be causing you distress. It's like, sorry, we're locked in. Um and yeah. that's reality, isn't so it? So we are locked in at yeah. the moment and we've been looking down this barrel for a while. It's not been Side's first choice of what to do, but I'm driven <laughs> and I've got this vision <laughs> and I know what the future of medicine looks like and I know I can create it together, which is our vision statement. And so we have decided to embark, embark upon this next 12 months of work, uh, working a 50 to 60 hour week minimum. And um, so what we've decided to do is to uh, tackle it like we're athletes and um, like we're, we've been in training for the last five weeks. So obviously we've stopped alcohol. Um, we've gone on to a keto diet. Now I have to understand um, keto diet isn't necessarily a, a well-balanced, healthy diet. It's a high-fat, high-protein diet, and there's lots of complications with that. So understanding our genetic predispositions, um, I know we're both terrible at B12, producing B12. We've got the foot 2 gene. And um, so just really assessing all of where our um, biological weaknesses are, size assessing where all our psychological weaknesses are, and we're really trying to biohack them. And um, so the keto diet's one thing. We've got a strict sleep-wake cycle. Uh, we're meditating once or twice a day. It's, it's a non-negotiable for me, meditation. COVID gave me that, one of the many benefits. Uh, we're moving every day. We're walking daily. I've gotten rid of my sitting desk. I've got a standing desk in the office, so I'm not in such a sedate state constantly. Um, what are the other things we're doing? Well, it was interesting when we were reflecting on it, you know, perhaps what are some of the important things that are missing as well and oh, some of the really right. important things for self-care and health is having 
different recreation, having other activities mm. outside and having connections with the community so mm. and friends. So we kind of realised we need to keep those in there somewhere. Social wellness. Totally. Social wellness. Absolutely. Yeah. So we saw where our shortfalls were or the risks were as well. Mm. And then I've got a, a weekly bodywork session in there. It's either acupuncture, osteo, massage or bioresonance. Um, and then there's the mindset, mm. which I think is a really massive part. Um, so I'm really trying to replace this mindset of, okay, it's Saturday. I got to Saturday. Okay, go me. Okay, I'm at Saturday. And I've changed that to, oh, my God, it's Monday. Oh, wow, it's Monday. The potential of this week is ahead of me and I'm going to get so much done and I'm so excited that it's Monday. So just that mindset around how we're turning up and we're still working on that too. Mm. Um, but these are all strategies that we're having to use and, and we're having to really hone them all and, and master them quickly because we haven't started the build yet, um, but it starts in four weeks. So we've got four weeks to really gather this stuff around. But, yeah, entrepreneurs work at a furious rate, don't they? Oh, yeah. They need to look after themselves. <laughs> there's, there's, no, there's no stopping. But the social wellness is a great a great mm. one as well. Yeah. You know, we, that connection with community and friends and yeah. family and we, uh, we, we kind of get very insular and goal-driven in these things and then Rome's burning around us sometimes with all mm. those social connections as well. So, so was, is there anything else that you wanted to add before we kind of wrap up today? I'd uh, just uh, like to acknowledge that these conversations are just so helpful to, to people out there, particularly people working really hard, again, whether it's in the home or looking after loved ones or looking after children that are really unwell or in really intensive workspaces or, you know, the, also the impacts we know of just uh, inflation and how much that's affecting people's daily lives and the amount of stress. Mm. So um, supporting people to be aware of those stresses and how to work with them mindfully and sensitively and, um, yeah, with, with self-compassion. I just want to acknowledge the work you're doing, Ryan. It's it's really powerful stuff. I appreciate that. It's, um, it's, a, it's very much a small contribution but it feels also like we're going into a bit of a pressure cooker these next few years as well. Mm. So I think it's uh, having these conversations and with people that are, really care about these types of things is, is terrific. So, mm. no, thank you. Um, so... Last, last, I guess the last but not least is there's people at home and they they want to reach out. Simon, how do they actually contact you and, and where's the best way to, to kind of get in contact with you, mate? I think the best way to get in contact is, is through the website because then you get a sense and a feeling of the Health Lodge as a whole uh, and there are lots of um, great practitioners um, at the Health Lodge. Um, so it gives you a, a, a sense of how we work as an integrative practice. Yeah, and then an opportunity to get a sense of who could be someone that's good to work with. And I might just add that sometimes it can be complicated to work out how to get into the right practitioner for you at the right time. So I do offer um, just a, a complimentary session that you can book 15 minutes um, and I'll call you back just hear a little bit about the support you're needing and then I'll point you in the direction of the right team. So um, you were very lucky to get into Simon's room. I know. Um, and Rachel knew, get this guy to the team meeting. <laughs> I hear there's these team meetings that happen, if I can get him to the team meeting, and they do. They happen yes. twice a week, every Tuesday and Friday. We all, 23 of us, sit around and workshop yes. the best way forward for these patients. So I can take the cases to the team meeting. I facilitate them. Um, or it may just be really obvious. It may be, yeah, no, you just need a bit of acupuncture um, and we need to get your sleep cycle in place. Um, And, you know, listeners can book a um, 15-minute complimentary session with me and I can help direct them to the right. That will be be absolutely amazing. So what's the Mm. website? Thehealthlodge.com.au. That's pretty simple. Easy. That's all, all, um, that's terrific. And I think, you know, I mean, both Rach and I have – had the good fortune of kind of being involved with the health lodge. And I think what's what's fantastic about it is that holistic approach to all of this as well. And I think there's not one size fits all for any, everybody and it. Everything yeah. is really bespoke to to the individual as well. Whereas I think to, unfortunately too much of health these days is pop this, do this, and you'll be right. So um, this yeah. holistic approach is just fantastic. Thank you so much. I think also I'm just so grateful to have 
you guys in my life as well. It's definitely a journey. It takes a village to kind of get through all of this. And hopefully someone who's listening today um, knows that it, it it's it's an it's a feeling that is normal that mm. can happen. It creeps up on mm. you. It's like this silent shadow, and then the signs are there, but then it, it, it you got to listen, listen mm. to your body, um, listen to these types of areas, and be vulnerable. Go and seek help. It it doesn't mean anything less of you. Um, bring people into your life to be able to support you through that, and then how do you shift your lifestyle to be able to like we want to be. I want to be there for my grandkids and and I want to be healthy. I don't want just to be aged. I want to be healthy mm-hmm. around all of this as well. So um, thank you for all the work that you do, Simon. Mm. Um, Al, you know, you. I can't tell you how much you've helped helped me as well. Ren, you're sharing your story, um, you know, and the even just the, the, the opportunity to be able to think about some of the the real relatable things people can kind of do in their life that I'm sure people got a lot out of that. And Rach, I love you. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Okay. That's a wrap. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah.